A history of CAPS. CAPS, cryopyrin associated periodic syndrome. It's a rare genetic auto-inflammatory condition caused by mutations in a gene called NLRP3. There are three separate types of CAPS. The mildest type is called familial cold auto-inflammatory syndrome, FCAS. A little bit worse is Muckle-Wells syndrome, MWS. The acronym takes longer to say, considered as the moderate or middle severity disease. The most severe type has two different names depending on where you live. In Australia and in the US, it's NOMID, Neonatal Onset Multisystem Inflammatory Disease. In Europe, it's SINCA, Chronic Infantile Neurological Cutaneous and Articular Syndrome. A few years ago, there was a push to rename the conditions to NLRP3 AID, Mild, Moderate and Severe. While there is a certain tidiness to that, NLRP3 AID doesn't really make things much clearer because gene names like NLRP3 aren't generally known by people who don't work with them. And AID is used for autoimmune diseases, which involve the adaptive immune system, while auto-inflammatory diseases involve the innate immune system. Plus, when you start talking in plural, AID becomes AIDS, and that's already another well-known condition that is very different to CAPS. AIDS is an adaptive immune deficiency, while CAPS is an innate immune hyperactivity. So we stick with CAPS and its subheadings of FCAS, Muckle-Wells, and NOMID or SINCA. The first published literature clearly describing FCAS came from two American doctors in 1940, Roy Kyle from Cincinnati and Howard Rusk from St. Louis. They described a patient with an eruption following a general exposure to cold. The eruption was urticaria, a skin rash, a chill with fever, joint stiffness and erythema, which is redness of adjacent tissues lasting six to eight hours, but sometimes one or two days and sometimes also with a headache. The patient described 23 out of 47 family members with the same ailment and the doctors noted it was only inherited by family members who also had the condition, which we know from my last video means dominant inheritance. These doctors viewed it as a type of allergy to cold and they tried treating it with insulin and potassium, which of course did not help at all. They noted that many other doctors had also tried various treatments, none of which had worked either. So there it was left in 1940 as a most interesting case. There were papers earlier than this describing patients with cold triggered skin rashes, but most focused on contact reactions, like an ice cube on the skin, which is not a CAPS thing. Harold Levine from Boston published a review of the literature in 1935, describing several types of cold sensitiveness. One type had been inferred by Dr. William Duke from Kansas City in Missouri, who described a systemic reaction to cold without a local reaction, suggesting a disorder in the heat regulating mechanism. But he was also focused on allergic reactions. In those days, they used to take blood from a human patient when their symptoms were at their worst, then separate the serum and inject it into the skin of another human to see if they could bring about the same reaction. It was called the Prausnitz Kustner test, and that has its own interesting history. So from Kyle and Rusk in 1940, we fast forward to 1962 and a paper called Urticaria Deafness and Amyloidosis, a new heredofamilial syndrome by Dr. Thomas J. Muckle and Dr. Michael Wells from the Derbyshire Royal Infirmary in which they introduced a syndrome they believed had not been reported before. It was specifically the combination of the three conditions, the rash, hearing loss and amyloidosis that they saw as unique. Driving home the seriousness of these conditions, three of the four siblings in their case studies died from the amyloidosis before they published their paper because there was no treatment. The two sisters who died were in their late fifties and the brother was just 39. Muckle and Wells personally studied 35 of their family members who described aggy bouts, what today we call flares, which they said were difficult to classify, which for me is still true today. Aggy in the state of having a high fever accompanied by shaking or shivering. They described transient malaise, feeling generally rubbish, rigors, again, shaking or shivering and feeling cold, but with the sweats. Lassitude, what we would call fatigue, headache and pain in limbs and joints. In this particular family, they said triggers were heat and emotion, while cool surroundings, sedatives and vitamin D seemed to help. They compared their new Muckle-Well syndrome to a few other conditions, most notably to familial Mediterranean fever, 
another inherited autoinflammatory disease. Noting the similarity of amyloidosis in both conditions, but the difference of hearing loss that isn't generally seen in FMF. The earlier paper by Kyle and Rusk also noted their patient had hearing loss, but with the dermatology background of Kyle, they'd focused on this, the cold triggered skin rash and the idea of the cold allergy. Dr. Muckle published a follow up paper in 1979 in which he presented many more cases and stated that amyloidosis was a secondary complication of the inflammatory episodes. As in the 1962 paper, Mucklewell syndrome was compared to other conditions that appeared related, again including FMF, but the specific differences in presentation were highlighted, again the hearing loss that's seen in Mucklewell syndrome. As a quick aside, there is an idea about familial Mediterranean fever that that condition actually provided an advantage during the plague, giving sufferers a resistance to the Yersinia pestis bacterium that causes the plague. Stories have been told and papers have been published on this idea. And of course, humans are always looking for reasons why things are the way they are. Nobody has come up with anything like this yet for CAPS, but the idea is always open that CAPS might persist in the population because like FMF, it gives us some kind of selective advantage too. I look forward to finding out what that is, if it is a thing, because mutants are meant to have superpowers, right? All this suffering can't be for nothing. In 1981, a French group described three unrelated children with rash, chronic meningitis, fever, enlarged lymph nodes, enlarged spleen, large joint arthritis, eye lesions, enlarged head circumference, and intellectual disability. It's classic NOMID. They had published these cases earlier in French, and this is a good time to highlight that I've only really considered English in putting this history together. And obviously this comes from an Australian perspective. Every country and every family will have its own history of CAPS. In 1975, a short case study was published by some doctors in Carlisle, Northern England, describing two of three children in one family with a condition that showed all the hallmarks of NOMED or SINCA, even going so far as to compare it with the Mucklewell syndrome, but ruling that out due to the absence of amyloidosis, which we know was probably because they were still young kids and it just hadn't happened yet. If I keep digging, I'll probably find more case study papers like these because CAPS conditions have existed for a long time. They just didn't know what it was or have any way to treat it. I can trace CAPS in my family back over 200 years to my great, great, great grandparents who emigrated to Australia from the UK. And it goes further back. I just haven't gone there yet. So there were some early published case studies of cold induced urticaria by the 1940s later being called familial cold urticaria because of the family groups, then the Mucklewell syndrome in the 1960s, and in the 1980s, what would become NOMID or SINCA. Three separate conditions, none of them understood and none of them treatable. In the 1990s, people started mapping genes and genome-wide association studies were used to try and pinpoint genetic causes for diseases. One of my favorite people, the brilliant Hal Hoffman, with some help, figured out that familial cold urticaria was connected to chromosome one, right down the bottom of what is called the long arm or Q at locus or position 44. So if you've seen 1Q44 on your genetic test results, that's what that means. In his seminal paper of 2001, he renamed the condition to familial cold autoinflammatory syndrome, giving the condition a little more context and named the gene CIAS1, which stood for Cold Induced Autoinflammatory Syndrome 1. It turned out not to be a good gene name because CIA. So it has been known as several other things, but without making this too confusing, this is the same gene that we now call NLRP3. I believe it was Hal's wife who came up with the meaningful name of cryopyrin for the NLRP3 protein, from Greek cryo meaning icy and pyrin meaning fire, this word cleverly reflects both the cold trigger and the heat associated with the inflammation that follows. She's a smart lady because cryopyrin has also been a beautifully unique internet search term. In 1999, a French group had also mapped Muckle Wells to 1Q44, and in March of 2002, they published their work with five specific mutations in 12 families with either Muckle Wells or FCAS declaring that Mucklewells and FCAS were the same condition on a spectrum, further suggesting that there may be other conditions in the group. Barely a month later, another French group published that their Sinker patients had gene mutations in CIA as one. 
Then in September, a collaboration of UK, Swiss and Canadians published their findings confirming the genetics and overlapping disease features in FCAS and muckle wells. And finally, an American group published in December that they had found CIA S1 mutations in some of their NOMID patients, taking the number of known CAPS related mutations to 20. I think now we're over 200. But 2002 was a big year of reveals. And by the end of 2002, we had our three separate conditions of FCAS, Muckle Wells and Nomid or Sinker confirmed as CAPS conditions on a spectrum of severity, all connected to the CIA S1 gene that we now know as NLRP3. 2002 was also the year that the inflammasome got its name, but inflammasome research was in its infancy. The immediate challenge was to find a treatment for the patients, because that's the main goal, right? It had been recently discovered that the cryopyrin protein was involved in the regulation of a cytokine called interleukin-1. Interleukin-1 was discovered in the 1970s, and that is a fascinating history of its own. In fact, there's a wonderful presentation by Charles Dinarello on my interleukin-1 playlist that is well worth watching. But the relationship between NLRP3 and interleukin-1 had given the American group the idea to try an interleukin-1 blockade treatment for the CAPS patients. Kineret had been developed for the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis. Kineret is an interleukin-1 receptor antagonist, which means it sits in the receptor for interleukin-1 and blocks it. The results from the clinical trials were remarkable. And in 2004, two papers published the excellent response from FCAS and Muckle Wells patients to this treatment, with a follow-up reporting further success in a NOMID patient with a de novo mutation and a response from a Dutch group who found the same thing with clinically diagnosed sinker. So clinically diagnosed just means no mutation was found and the patients were diagnosed based on symptoms alone. And a de novo mutation you can probably figure out is a spontaneous mutation that has occurred in the individual rather than something inherited from a parent. See, these conditions are not always inherited and this seems to be more often the case with NOMID. Even in the inherited conditions, they had to start somewhere, right? Somewhere, someone back there over 200 years ago in my family had a de novo mutation that we've been stuck with ever since. And so Kineret was our new wonder drug. And when I say our, I mean the patients in the studies, obviously. It took 10 more years for Kineret to get approval on our pharmaceutical benefits scheme here in Australia. In fact, it was on the PBS for rheumatoid arthritis, but had been taken off in 2010 because it wasn't all that effective for rheumatoid arthritis. And then it was put back on in 2014 for CAPS and only for CAPS. And it really is past time that it was made available for other auto-inflammatory diseases. In 2008, another drug called Rylonocept, brand name Arcalist, was approved in the US to treat CAPS. And in 2009, the FDA approved canakinumab, brand name Ilaris. We can't get those drugs here in Australia. For CAPS, Kineret remains our only option. But it seemed like the job was done. The mystery of CAPS was solved. Patients could be treated. Kineret not only improved the quality of life for CAPS patients, but also extended life expectancies by preventing amyloidosis. As time went on and follow-up studies were completed, Kineret always showed a good safety profile for CAPS. And the initial cautionary practice of taking patients off Kineret if they developed an infection has been changed to keeping them on it to prevent additional disease flares from further complicating the situation. Hundreds of papers have been published, but in 2022, a landmark collaborative paper was published as a standardised guide for the treatment of CAPS and other interleukin-1 mediated auto-inflammatory diseases. However, many CAPS patients do still suffer with complications not covered by the interleukin-1 blockade approach. Better drugs are needed and they are in development. Kineret is a fairly painful daily injection, so you can imagine patients, and especially poor little kids, would much prefer a tablet. The injections also need to be kept strictly refrigerated, which makes travelling difficult and stressful, and stress triggers flares. Plus, Kineret recently had its first real blemish as far as safety goes, with a 2022 paper presenting two NOMID patients suffering from injection site-related amyloidosis, which is different from the amyloidosis we can get if our disease is not properly controlled, but equally serious. So that brings us up to current day and the current challenges to get new and better meds and to get the information out there about CAPS to doctors and patients, especially the 2022 treatment guidelines, because a lot of doctors have never heard of it and are still dismissive of patients presenting with CAPS symptoms. 
Caps is rare, but not as rare as they might think. It's been around for a really long time and it's been treatable for 20 years.